everything for it. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Satya. And now, first of all, I'd also like to thank the organizers uh, for putting this together. It's wonderful after this Corona break uh, to be back and to discuss physics and other things uh, in person. So um, the title indicates a certain shift, I think, in perspective which the field underwent over the last five or six years or so. So originally, the attempt was successful attempt, actually, to derive um, exact relations, the Ajinsky relation fluctuation theorem. And more recently, I think, we're using these tools to infer properties of systems that are not, I mean, the properties which are not otherwise uh, directly accessible. And this is uh, the story I wanted to tell you today about. But just briefly, uh, over here, uh, I guess most of you know the basic idea of stochastic thermodynamics is that uh, we want to explore whether the rules which have been developed here can be applied to such small machines like this F1 uh, ATPA, it's a rotary machine, which upon hydrolyzation of one ATP molecule undergoes the step of 120 degrees. So in the single molecule experiments, you can actually see the effect of single chemical reaction. And it's quite remarkable. Um, so the plan of the talk is, I'll give you a, a brief recapitulation of the basic principles of stochastic thermodynamics, and then arguably the major tool um, for the theorems has been the thermodynamic uncertainty relation, which gives a universal bound on the precision of any process. It allows inference of entropy production, uh, you'll see that it gives a model field bound and the efficiency of molecular motors. And more recently, we looked into the question how that, uh, in a sense, how the thermodynamic limit of this, of this relation looks like. Then I'll talk about a new approach where we get um, inference from waiting time distribution, waiting times between transitions. And finally, I want to talk about the cost of or the inference from um, coherent oscillations in, in biochemical systems. Okay, so uh, just for um, recapitulation, uh, Sergio talked about this, I can be very brief. For this paradigmatic situation of a particle driven across a periodic potential, um, Ekimoto told us how to formulate uh, the first law along a fluctuating trajectory. So the dW, du, dq are fluctuating quantities along a trajectory um, and then uh, by looking at the time reverse trajectory, you get the total entropy production, for instance, as the log ratio of observing the original trajectory divided by the probability for observing the time reversed one. And it turns out this has two contributions. One is the such defined uh, heat along the trajectory, and then there's this boundary term, which is uh, sometimes called stochastic entropy. And with this relation, it's trivial uh, to derive one of these nice relations of stochastic thermodynamics, the integral relation uh, valid for any initial condition, any type of driving, but um, get an even nicer relation, uh, since Clemens is still here, I'm showing uh, the experimental illustration of this fluctuation theorem, <coughs> where some 15 years ago, uh, we looked at entropy production in this system. So this is the distribution after two seconds, highly non-Gaussian, after 20 seconds. But when you plot that log ratio, you find this nice slope uh, of one as, as you should. So in a sense, this is the kind of first phase of stochastic thermodynamics. You derive nice relations and you give nice illustrations. But now suppose in this experiment, I mean, what have we learned about the system. Nothing which we didn't yet know before. We basically have confirmed that it follows a Longina equation for which this, this, this theorem is, is an identity. So, um, I mean, if you already know what the entropy production is, you can certainly measure it and plot that distribution. But suppose you measure some quantity and the slope doesn't come out as one or there is not even a slope, then you're basically lost. I mean, you have, there's no way what you, you can't say more than this quantity is not the entropy production. Uh, so before I come to how you can do better, let me um, remind you on the second paradigm in the field. These are master equations. We had this already during this meeting. 
Uh, so here uh, I take this cartoon of a molecular motor walking along a track driven by chemical energy pulling a weight. And the key idea is that you have to identify mesostates with their free energies. Um, it's the Markovian dynamics on these mesostates. The rates are not arbitrary, but the rates have to fulfill the cru crucial detailed balance condition, which involves in the exponent the free energy difference of the mesostates. And if chemical reactions are involved, the change of the free energy of the chemical reservoirs, and if you work against the force, this will also show up uh, in the exponent dij is how much the motor advances in the, in the transition from i to j. The interesting quantities are the um, empirical or fluctuating currents and, uh, of course, uh, the entropy production here uh, written as, as a rate. Now, I will mostly talk about non-equilibrium steady states, and in those, uh, the entropy production can be written in three different ways. You can either sum over all links. Ti s is the stationary probability to be in I, Kij is the transition rate. Or, for instance, in a five-state system, you can sum over cycles times affinities of a cycle. The affinity of a cycle is the uh, log ratio of all forward, product of all forward rates divided by all backward rates. Or you can write the total entropy production in a kind of macroscopic way is a macroscopic current JK times the physical driving field, which would be, for instance, the delta nu of the chemical reactions involved or the external force. Now, if you have access on any of the three levels to all quantities, you get the full entropy production. This is an unrealistic situation. The challenge is what to do if we don't have this kind of information. Can we still make statements? Okay, um, and before I come to that, I want to find out a kind of two perspectives on, on the inequalities I will be showing to you. So what I, uh, what I just said basically refers to this first um, interpretation. So if we get a lower bound in terms of experimentally accessible quantities, sigma, I remind you, is the entropy reduction rate. Then, of course, yes, we get an experimentally accessible lower bound on this quantity. However, we, can, we may also be able to interpret it in the following way. Suppose we have the relation where on the right-hand side we have the function of something which is desirable. Then this will tell us the minimal thermodynamic cost of achieving something desirable. And I will come to this, uh, well, I will actually start with this. So what could be desirable? Well, in a conference like this, it would be desirable to have precise clocks, right? Now we're operating here at 300K. So the question which got me into this is actually very much this question. Um, there will, such a clock at 300K will not be inf infinitely precise. There are fluctuations. The question I had, I asked myself was, does a more precise watch need more energy? in its operation. Is there a trade-off between precision and thermodynamic cost? And I give you the answer here for a huge class of systems uh, one can now prove that such a clock with a precision of one second per day will cost at least 10 to the minus 11 joule per day. I mean, there's no way how you could figure out that number if you don't know the calculation, but uh, this is just as a motivation of what I'm going to show you. Okay, so how do we get to a result like this? Well, of course, uh, we start with the simplest clock we can imagine. Um, this is now one which, let's say, which for each step uh, needs a hydrolysis of an ATP. That's how it is driven. So let's say after uh, one minute, we want typically 60. If we are looking at the ha second hand of a watch, we want 60 steps. On average, um, this may be realizable, but sometimes it may make 59, sometimes 62. So such an output comes with a variance, and we define the uncertainty as the ratio between the variance and the output squared, just in order to have a dimensionless uh, quantity. And of course, uh, you all know that you get this kind of diffusive uh, behavior. Now, 
Um, this cost or this log doesn't run for free. There is a thermodynamic cost associated with it. I just told you about this log ratio of rates. So it's easy for this asymmetric random walk to convince yourself that this is the expression for the entropy production rate. And this ratio of the rates is given by the chemical or the physical driving force which drives the clocks. And if that is associated with ATP hydrolysis, it's just a difference in chemical potential between uh, EDAX and rate. Now you put these trivial things together and you find that the product between cost and uncertainty is given by this hyperbolic function, which is always larger than two, two KBP. Okay. Now this is of course a very simple clock. Uh, there are more expensive ones like Swiss ones, which have feedback uh, feedback mechanisms, epicycles. Now the remarkable fact is that the MIT group was able to prove our conjecture based on, I mean, our conjecture was based on a lot of numerics and limiting cases, but we were not able to find a ma mathematical proof that this relation holds for any process which can be described by such a Markov dynamics uh, on discrete states. And yes, please. The number of units doesn't matter. I mean, finite. Um, and if so, the, this, you have this relation between cost and uh, uncertainty. And if you take this number, you get what I had on this previous slide of 10 to the minus 11. Um, so from a f theory perspective, uh, the statement is a little bit, or is, is, is kind of general in the following sense. You associate with any such network a current where you assign a weight dij to each link ij, dij is anti-symmetric, and then the statement is that the entropy production rate in the, in, the, in the total network is larger than the mean current squared divided by the dispersion of this current. That's the mathematical statement. And that holds for any current in any such network in non-equilibrium states. Uh, okay, since this is mostly a theory uh, workshop, let me sketch on one page the proof which we were not able to find. This is not the original proof, uh, which was based on large deviations. This is the proof by Descartes and Sasa, which I think is the one which is most accessible for students. So we start with the generating function for an observable Q, uh, which is a function of, of the trajectory. And then um, we imagine on the same network a different dynamics with different rates, K dagger, um, and rewrite this generating function in this trivial form using this comparison dynamics P dagger, which we then can um, bound using Jensen by the uh, kullback leibler distance between the two distributions. Now you have to make sure that you choose comparison rates such that in the limit Z to zero, Z is your, your, your counting variable here, uh, that this, in this limit you recover the old um, dynamics and when, when you make sure that um, this is true, uh, you get this kind of relation between the variance uh, and this pullback leibler distance. And then um, you look for a variational ansatz with a variational ansatz for rates, which make sure that the stationary distribution is the same in both dynamics and that all the currents are sped up of a certain factor. And when you plug that in with a few more lines, uh, you get this statement on the variance of this uh, quantity on its mean and on the entropy production. And from this proof, you can actually you see actually that it holds even for finite time. You don't have to wait for the infinite time limit. Okay. And that's what we first uh, found in, in this paper and the fact that it holds in finite time was first proven by Horovitch and, and Ekman. Okay. So this is now um, in a sense established let me now show you what you can do with it. Uh, and my favorite uh, illustration, uh, non-trivial illustration, I think is from molecular motors. So uh, I remind you on a typical experiment, these are data from a blocks group some 23 years ago. Uh, they looked at a molecular motor, which is called kinesine. That molecule walks along a track, which is called microtubule. 
it's driven by ATP excess. It, wa it walks to the right and they applied a force against which it uh, has to walk uh, using this kind of, of feedback uh, setup. So the motor, that's important for us, the motor walks against the constant externally uh, imposed force. So what did they measure? They measured the mean velocity of the motor, they measured the dispersion in this velocity, which is this, this diffusion uh, constant, and they expressed uh, the, these quantities in, in the ratio called the randomness parameter, and here you see that randomness as a function of ATP concentration for different applied forces, or as a function of the applied force, the load, as a uh, for constant ADP. So these are the kind of data. And then typically as a theorist, you build a model and you try to fit uh, this kind of data as, as, as good as possible. Uh, with this uncertainty relation, we have now a second option, which is model three. And that works as follows. Um, so let's, let's say, let's start here. Let's look at the efficiency. Thermodynamic efficiency of this mode I just described to you, eta is the ratio between the output and the input. The output is force, uh, is velocity against the externally imposed force. The input is chemical energy. Or in terms in rates, it's uh, force times velocity and energy per, per unit time. Now you don't know, you don't know how much ATP the molecule, molecular motor needs. You, you can't see how an ATP molecule is hydrolyzed. You don't see a single molecule. But what you know is that the difference between input and output, as always in thermodynamics, that is the dissipation, that is the entropy production. So this entropy production is the difference between chemical energy you put in and this measurable output. And for the entropy production, we have this, uh, uh, this uncertainty relation which I just showed you. So you plug that in here, and you find that this eta is um, upper bounded by this right hand side, which contains, and that's the key point, which contains only experimentally measurable quantities, the velocity, that dispersion, and the force. So here I've shown you the right hand side um, overlaid over the, the data points I've just shown you on the previous slide. So, Let's, for instance, take this data point. This orange curve is the 45% curve. So we now know that under these conditions at this load, with this measured uh, diffusion and velocity, this molecular motor here is at most 45% efficient in transforming chemical energy into mechanical work. It's an upper bound. I'm not saying it is 45%. Efficient, but it's not more than that. It could be 10%, 25%, 2%. Okay? So, uh, and this is a statement which is model free. I'm just assuming that on some deep level, I can describe this molecular motor by such a Markov method. Um, and I think that's, that's quite a remarkable, a remarkable statement which shows the power of, the, of these inequalities for thermodynamic inference as a tool of thermodynamic inference. Okay. Oh, by the way, I don't mind if you interrupt if there are questions. Okay. Um, now I want to uh, come to generalization, which goes beyond non-equilibrium steady states. Uh, with my grad student, Timo Koyo, we were able to generalize this to time-dependently driven systems in the following way. We now assume again we have a network like this, but now the rates depend on an external parameter and this external parameter is time dependent. And we assume that the experimentalist can speed up the, how this external parameter changes. So there is a velocity with which Sergio or Clemens turn the knob. Okay. And the system is driven for total time uh, calligraphic capital P. Um, and as observables, you can, for instance, take the total time spent in state I. So suppose you only see state, or you see state three, you can measure how much time has the system spent in state three. Such an observable has a mean, and such an observable has a dispersion. And mean and dispersion now, of course, depend on the total time, and they depend on the speed parameter. 
And the generalization of the uncertainty relation is, is, is this kind of inequality. So on the right-hand side, you have the entropy production rate now averaged over this time-dependently driven situation. Here you have the mean, and you now have to know or to infer experimentally to measure how that mean changes with the observation time and with the speed parameter. This is all something you can do operationally. Um, and then um, you get, again, uh, this lower bound on the entropy production. You can use other observables. For instance, you can just check in which, this, in which state is the system at the final time, and how does that change with the speed of driving and the observation time. Okay, now I want to show you an application, again, a real-world um, application, uh, and this gives me the chance to introduce a really nice system uh, from Matthias Weeks group in Munich some 10 years ago. It's small uh, peptide called Calmodulin, and they were putting this peptide with linkers between optical tweezers, and then they applied a constant force on this molecule, and they were observing its length. And what they found were these kind of traces. And they were able, from these length trajectories, to uh, extract six different measles states. So this here is a folded measles state. So the, the molecule consists of two spheres in the folded state. But they were also able, if they pull harder, um, to get misfolded or partially folded state, to get even misfolded state, where a red half sphere is folded to a blue half sphere or uh, the totally unfolded state. And the nice thing about this experiment is they were able to measure all these this residence times and the transition rates, and it turned out to be Markovian on the six states. So it's really very clean, beautiful bio, biophysical experiment. Okay, so we were taking that data and plugging, um, now running a time-dependent experiment. So they, they did that constant force, or various constant forces, but now we have the, uh, from their data, we have the force dependence of all rates. So we can imagine we now um, put the molecule under a time dependent force. And let's say we just measure where it's at the end of the experiment, it's in this state one, two. This is one, one of these six measles states. And now we plug that in into this previous relation. This is the red curve. So here is the NSAID as a function of the speed of driving. And uh, what I'm plotting here is the quality of that uncertainty relation, i.e. How, how much, how, which fraction of the true entropy production do you recover by using that bound? And for instance, you see here you get 35, yeah. yeah. Well, in, in our case, we can calculate the bound because we have all rates. So we calculate just the, the mean and the dispersion relation and everything, or we could we could do a, we can run a simulation. We can run a simulation. Um, or you could look, for instance, what is the total time spent in the unfolded state? That's the blue curve, and you see you get seventy five percent of the total entropy production. And again, the key point is in this analysis, you do not need to know anything. You don't need to know the force. You don't need to know um, the rates. From an experimental point of view, you're just looking at this observable. How does this observable change with the, type, with, the, with the speed of driving and so on? And you get lower bounds on the total entropy production, completely model-free. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is, um, we start here in equilibrium. We start in equilibrium at this given force, but we do not expect that at the end the system has, is already in equilibrium. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right, right. Everything is changing, but we're looking at the fraction between the bound and the true entropy production, which we know in this case because we know the force dependence of all rates. That it certainly depends on the V, yes, definitely so. Yeah, Christian. No. No. 
not yet. What we have is something on uh, interacting uh, on many particle systems. Yes, yes, yes. So, so, so far, this is just on the mean. Yes, you're right. Um, so let me uh, read two slides on this quite recent work. Uh, so as Christian just said, so, so far all these applications, I mean, the time-dependent application were for a small system. The clock, in a sense, is still a small system. So uh, one of the natural question is how, how does this um, tour um, look at, uh, how does it develop as the system gets bigger? So we're using here a driven lattice gas. We take two species. We have different charges. We have next neighbor uh, interactions. Of course, uh, also hard core. And we are in the one phase in the one phase region. And we assume that operationally accessible are um, one the one particle current. So we are, we assume we can able to follow uh, a red particle. We are able to be uh, to follow a blue particle. We can measure diffusion coefficients of this uh, one particle currents, and we can look at two particle correlations. So current current correlation between a red and a red, a red and a blue, a blue and a blue. These are our observables. Now the tour holds for any current. So it holds for any linear combination of currents. So you can ask what is the best linear combination of currents which yields the strongest bound. This is a question uh, Andreas de Kant um, looked at, and uh, that led to what he calls the multidimensional tour. And we're just using that expression, but we're now applying it uh, to this situation. So the estimate for the entropy production rate based on this optimal current uh, J, which is a, s a combination uh, of all these quantities, um, is, is as follows. Now. Um, don't have to go through the details here, but these measured quantities enter enter this estimate. That's that's the main idea. And now we can look at uh, how this estimate, how that scales uh, with the system size, of course, at constant density. And again, I'm showing you a, a quality factor. So this is how much of the total entropy production can we retrieve by, for instance, uh, looking at three different um, types of currents, this blue, cur the blue curve, that's the optimal linear combination of, of currents. And again, you get, this is now as a function of system size. Uh, well, here you get kind of 15%. If you look just at the total particle current, that's weaker because it's not the optimal one. And if you, for instance, look at the current which is associated with external power, so basically charge uh, of the one particle currents weighted with their charges, you get something which is even worse. But the key point is, in all, in all cases, you get something of order one in the thermodynamic limit. So the tour survives the thermodynamic limit. Will survive, yes. That is true, but even if you use as a current in the uncertainty relation, the total entropy production, you do not get the full entropy production. Well, that the, um, the variance of the entropy production and the mean, that ratio doesn't yield the mean. Yes, yes. Yes, I mean, beyond linear response, uh, that doesn't saturate. Exactly. Um, and again, I'm emphasizing, for, for, in order to apply this, you don't need to know the driving field. You don't need to know the charges uh, of your particles, and you don't need to know their interactions. Uh, and you can convince... Periodic boundary condition, yes, of course. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> Yes, good question. So we're assuming here that uh, we're in the one phase region. Okay, look, what, what I know is that in any finite system, um, if you wait long enough, uh, you're kind of ergodic, and then this is true. I don't want to make a statement what happens if you do the thermodynamic limit properly uh, in, in, in a two-phase or in, at the phase transition. It's a very interesting question the referees brought up, but uh, it's not. 
Well, no, no, I'm not suggesting this. Uh, I'm not suggesting this, even though we had nice referees this time. Okay. Um, and uh, it's easy to see that this previous relation and this formalism works also for interacting logical elements. Okay. Um, beyond the truth. Now I want to show you what, with essentially the same data, you can do which, which is better than the uncertainty relation. And this is when you now look at waiting time distributions between transitions. And that's a field which uh, started very recently. I'm showing you the version which was, our version which was just published. Okay, so what's, what's the situation? Uh, let me use this kind of simple four-state network as an illustration. Suppose you can only see uh, transitions from two to three, let's call it plus transition, and transitions from three to two, which is a minus transition. And you don't see any of the other transitions. Then you can look at the waiting time between two consecutive plus transitions. Let me call this psi plus plus. And you can look at the waiting time between two consecutive minus transitions. And we look at the log ratio. This is the crucial quantity. And for such a network, uh, such waiting time distributions, for instance, uh, look, look like this. Okay, now I'm describing three different topologies. Topology one is the system is unicyclic. So there is this link between one and three is missing. You only have a unicycle with n states. And you observe only one transition in a unicycle. When you observe only one transition in a unicycle, um, you can write down this or evaluate this um, waiting time distribution and you can convince yourself that the ratio between psi plus plus and psi minus minus um, is actually time independent and given by the exponent of the driving affinity of the cycle, which means that you just measure, if you measure this ratio, you have to find something which is time independent. And since the total entropy production is the current, which you easily get from such measurements, and from this ratio, you get the affinity of the cycle, you get the full entropy production rate by just looking at transitions between adjacent sites in a unicycle. And again, this is better than the tour. If you take the current, through that unicycle and its dispersion, and you plug it in the tour, you will not get the full entropy production. But using these waiting times, you get a better estimate. I mean, you, you get an estimate which is, which is exact. Of course, the interesting uh, cases are multicyclic systems. So here is an example where in such a network, you can only see transition one seven and seven one. Again, you look at this logarithmic ratio now it becomes time dependent, this ratio between these waiting times. Uh, and these are this is a specific calculation. You may get a curve like this. So what can we infer from this? I'm not showing uh, the proofs here, but various things. Uh, if you look at this ratio at very short times, yes. No, no, no. I mean, you, you look at... You know, how, how probable is it to have a transition here after a very short time, uh, again, the same, the, 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 oh, okay. okay? And the same for backwards, yes. Uh, okay. Be between two consecutive uh, transitions of the same type. Okay. So in that limit, you get the affinity of the shortest cycle. Um, so in this case, you get the, in that limit, you get the affinity, exact affinity of this three-state cycle because that's the shortest cycle to which this uh, link contributes. You can also prove uh, that the maximum of this uh, curve is a lower bound on the maximal affinity on all cycles to which this link contributes and likewise for the minimum. And again, you can ask how good are these uh, bounds? So here we did numerics on, uh, I think, uh, two million networks. And this again is the ratio. How well do you get this affinity? Uh, and again, you know, something between 10 and 80% is, is kind of typical. Yes, Holger. Yeah. Ah, 
Okay. If you, okay, yes, I mean, always, if you're completely disconnected, you will not get any information on that. That's, yeah, yeah. And again, these are, you know, lower bounds. Uh, yeah. Uh, and perhaps uh, from a uh, most interesting case is that you observe several links in the multicyclic system. So suppose you observe transition between these two and the blue ones, you get uh, the mean rate of four transitions, you get a waiting time distribution, so that would be, for instance, how long do you have to wait if a 4-5 transition follows a 1-7 transition, so you get a whole matrix of these quantities, and then you can prove that if you plug things together properly, you get a lower bound on the total entropy production, uh, and even you get even a statement when you get a full entropy production in case you don't have disconnected parts, uh, if all these quantities actually are time independent. Now the proofs of this relation is essentially building on ideas how you prove the fluctuation theorem when you look at trajectories and backwards trajectories and you have to put things properly together. A little bit of combinatorics, I mean, okay. The more you include, yes. And um, for the experts, so if you include uh, at least one bound of each uh, fundamental cycles, you get, perhaps not surprisingly, the full one. In which case, then these, these quantities are time independent. Okay, uh, and now my last topic is the cost of or inference from, remember this kind of dual perspectives on these problems, in systems where you see um, oscillations coherent oscillations. So one example, of course, you all know that we have, there are these circadian systems in, in our and other bodies where uh, the expression level of a certain protein oscillates in a 24, with a 24 hour period. And uh, people are able to reconstruct uh, such systems in, in, in a tube and you feed uh, such a mixture of enzymes proteins with ATP, and then you get this kind of curve. Of course, the very fact, and, and it's important to realize these are steady state conditions. I mean, you can have oscillations in st under steady state conditions. Steady state conditions mean you feed it with a constant chemical potential difference for the ATP hypothesis. So the fact that you get oscillations, of course, is, is, is well known. The question uh, we were asking ourselves is, what you want is, do you want that different realizations keep the phase? You want phase coherence of such oscillation. And the question is, again, if the system oscillates more coherently, keeps the phase over longer time, does it cost more energy, free energy, to create this kind of oscillation? It's a related question to the previous one, but it's actually uh, different. So again, we do first do the simple thing. So suppose you have such an n-state unicycle, uh, and you can look at, of course, you now have to look at an observable which shows correlations. So for instance, you can ask yourself, what's the correlation function to be in state one at time t, given that you were in state one at time zero? And this will just uh, oscillate. So this is for 100 states, not three, for 100 states driven by an affinity of 200. Sorry, I need some water. Driven by an affinity uh, of 200. And we define the number of coherent oscillations by, uh, this, this is the number of oscillations after which um, the amplitude of a correlation function has decayed one over E. So in this case, for instance, you would have about four coherent oscillations, and this is <coughs> denoted by this calligraphic N. Okay, so in this simple case, of course, unicyclic random walk, you can calculate everything exactly. So basically, we're talking about the ratio between the imaginary and the real part of the second eigenvalue. This is what we also had in, uh, in Maria's talk, even though uh, she didn't have imaginary parts, of course. So, and you, you get this. And then you can calculate the free energy cost or the entropy production per oscillation. 
and you find that it's given by four pi squared times the number of coherent oscillators. So for such a simple case, again, if the system is able to make more coherent oscillations, you have to pay for each oscillation already more. Again, conjecture based on lots of numerics, no mathematical proof by nobody as far as I know yet, that this holds true in any multi-cyclic network. What you would have to prove is, you would have to prove that the entropy production rate times the real part of the second eigenvalue is larger than the imaginary part squared. So if anybody is able to do that, I would be very happy to see that. Um, last application, we were using one of the uh, models for such a, a system. This was work by Van Walder and co-workers. Um, these are hexamers of uh, molecules, chi molecules, which compete. Uh, for this audience, we don't have to go through the uh, details. It's driven by ATP hydrolysis. We simulated this um, as a function of system size, i.e. system size now being the number of these hexamers. Uh, what you see here is the entropy production as a function of the uh, number of coherent oscillations for different driving forces, delta nu. The dashed line is the bound. And these are, the, in a sense, the real data for this kind of established excellent network. And it's kind of interesting to see that, uh, you know, the system is just about a factor of two or three off the bound. So, uh, in a sense, now measuring um, this coherence, you could infer a lower bound on the entropy production driving that biochemical cycle. Okay, so this brings me uh, in time to the end. I don't, presumably don't have to read what I've shown you, but let me highlight the people. Uh, the tour started with Andre Barato, who is now in Houston, Patrick, who is now postdoc in Dresden, Timo Koyok, who just finished with me. Waiting time distribution is the work by two uh, current grad students. Likewise, the os coherent oscillations, Lukas Oberreiter has just finished his PhD with me. Uh, and the mo most recent work was uh, uh, what Timo Koyuk did in the final parts of his thesis. Thank you very much.